it's always amazing to me how what's in vogue will so determine what people do. You know, it's, things change. I remember there was, and we went through a period of time where wood surfaces, varnish, shellac was not liked. And they'd, every time they'd go into an old house like that, they'd paint it. And now people just croak, you know, if you paint over. And it, it's funny when you watch how trends are, things change. And uh, at this point, really, almost anything old, they don't want you to touch it. Don't change anything. In fact, if you have something that's valuable, don't even finish it. It's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Shabbat Shalom. We are on the what day of the count? You should know. It's easy. Yeah, this is the easiest I've ever seen because it's the day of the month. No, it, 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 the count started going into Sunday. Sabbath night during Passover, that Sunday, what we celebrated as resurrection, is the first day. Well, if you do it the way we do, the way the Jews do it, it's the day after the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is the first day of unleavened bread, which this year is the same. The first day of unleavened bread was also the Sabbath, so we're together. But uh, I guess there was a def- a difference of opinion between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees felt like the Sabbath was always the weekly Sabbath, but the Pharisees says, no, that Sabbath is the the first day of unleavened bread. And to this day, you can get into big debates. And for whatever reason, most Messianics have followed the the Sadducean method. Uh, It does seem that it makes sense for Shavuot to happen on Sunday as well as the resurrection. But whatever day the resurrection happens, then that's Shavuot the way we do it. That's the 14th day. We are looking at a a little bit of numbers 2 and 3, and uh, Ron would be intimately acquainted with what these chapters are about, because these chapters are about how the camp of Israel is situated. And Joy mentioned identity. And when you study scripture, one of the things that becomes very apparent to you is your identity determines your destiny. Identity equals destiny. In fact, when you look at like Isaiah 56, which we like to quote, my house of prayer will be a house for all nations. My house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And you see what's up in there. The Lord promises an identity to the eunuch and he promises an identity to the foreigner which is to say they didn't have one. You don't give somebody something they have. And so this, the identity is, is crucial. And the way Israel was set up in the wilderness, your identity determined where you camped and when you set out. And the, uh, as you recall, if you re- listen to Ron when he has pronounced the tribes, you start with the tribes on the east. Those tribes are the first to set out, and they're the first to make camp. That's Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. I can remember those. It helps me to remember them because they're sons of Leah. It's it's the first and the fifth and the sixth son. They're over here on the east. You go to the south, it's Reuben, Simeon, and Gad, which is kind of an odd combination because Reuben and Simeon are also Leah's sons, but Gad is Leah's son through Zilpah. Then it goes to the center of the camp, which is Levi and Aaron. So those three tribes set out. Then second, it's those three three tribes set out. Then it's Levi, Aaron, the tabernacle, all the furnishings. Then it's the tribes to the west, which this is simple because it's the three tribes that come from Rachel. So it's Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. So it's, of course, Joseph, but his sons are Ephraim and Manasseh. Then Benjamin, and then finally to the north, it's Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And the, the reason for the order, I don't know, but I have memorized the sons by their mothers. And that, that helps me 
uh, whenever I'm, I'm thinking about Israel. In any case, so it, it spends some time describing this detail. And the thing that, that I think is essential for us to realize is that it, the way that God deals with people always will have to do with who they are. And if a person is outside of the who they are, there are ways to come into that. If final, the final part of the Torah reading this week in, the, in Numbers 3, this is verses 11 through 13, speaks specifically to Levi. And these are some of the verses we talked about when I was going to go over to Israel and share with them about Levi. This is Numbers 3, 11. Again, Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Now behold, I have taken the Levites from among the sons of Israel instead of every firstborn, the first issue of the womb among the sons of Israel. So the Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, from man to beast, they shall be mine, I am Yahweh. Again, this theme of identity. The, is, the Israelites are laid out and their planning is totally dependent on who they are. Then Levi's identity determines his place in Israel and also his relationship to the Father. And we've talked about it before, so we won't dwell on it today, but when Reuben lost the firstborn status, it was divided three ways in Israel. And it's astonishing the number of people that don't know this. It's an important thing for you to know, and it's important for you to help people because they, they can't figure out what happened. But the priesthood was given to Levi, the kingship to Judah, and the birthright to Joseph, which is immediately apparent because the birthright is the double portion, right? And Joseph ends up with two sons in Israel. Jacob adopts his two sons so that it's very plain that the birthright goes to Joseph. It's also mentioned in 1 Chronicles 5. Who you are determines what you do and where you belong. And if you look at the crisis that we face in our country today with... A, I don't know how many of you have seen this. Uh, Dave Moore was talking to me in, in church last week because he wanted to share it with Dave Harley, and Dave Harley is still a counselor. But probably some of you in education are aware of this, but the number of high schoolers needing counseling is just exponentially going up. It's becoming a crisis. What's the problem? We're not... No fathers, no father, no identity. And without identity, people are lost and they don't know what's happening. Where do you think this transgender, the gay, lesbian, all this stuff, where is it springing from? What, what's the spiritual source? Who am I? And what's more, I don't like who I am, and so I'm going to choose what I am. And that doesn't work either. Ron, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just... Utah's got quite a bad suicide rate in the, the young, but nationwide, they're having a terrific problem. And again, why would you want to destroy yourself? And I, and I certainly don't want to put a Band-Aid on something that's such a terrible wound, because these kids are suffering. I am not saying they're not suffering. They are suffering. But there is this lack of identity. And a lot of it is what you said, Lois. In fact, you've probably seen this too. The one consistent theme with every school shooter, lack of a father. There's something about a dad in the home that creates family. And see now, what are we doing to family now? How many families do we have where the children are not related to each other? It's a lot like our foundation family. How did it go with Israel, all the half-brothers? 
It's why we need healing. <laughs> the dysfunction. I've read this story to you before. I'm going to read your story and just listen to the story. We'll talk about it afterward. Don't, uh, I love stories, and I particularly love this one. This is Hans Christian Andersen, The Ugly Duckling. But I've, read, I, I've been reading this off and on for a while, and it got me reading about Hans Christian Andersen, who I found to be a terrifically fascinating figure. I, I think I shared this with Greg and uh, Ron yesterday. Hans Christian Andersen is one of the most brilliant storytellers that ever lived. His ability to see and to describe is second to none. He, none. He hated grammar. He hated grammar. I, I lost the statement. I've, I've been reading this biography. I need to go back and find what he said about, it was hilarious. Those mean-spirited wenches who are worrying about grammar. He was bad at grammar and he couldn't spell. One of the things I came out of this, we have to be so careful when we find a gift, when we find identity, that we don't think that everyone must look like me. And we also need to be careful. You would think if a child can't spell and doesn't understand grammar, that being a writer wouldn't be his call. Do you know often that's not the case? Jamie Buckingham couldn't spell that. I read one of his things that hadn't been edited yet, and I just, oh. And he got to the point he didn't worry about it. That's my editor's problem. I'm going to communicate. He came to this place of strength, and if you study Jamie Buckingham's story, his life was going nowhere till he realized who he was. He's a communicator. And, and, and it was just like the light went on, and it changed his life. So I'll read you the story. It's a corny story. I love the story. I'm up here. You're stuck with it. Now, here's another interesting thing. One of my favorite childhood memories is being read to. I can see myself as a six-year-old while my mom reads me the Hurlbut's Bible stories every day. And then my dad had this Portuguese book that he would read us stories out of. We loved those stories. And at the time, I didn't appreciate. Here he is flawlessly saying in English what he is fastly in his mind reading in Portuguese. And Dad was incredible. But so, you know, we're all different. But for me, one of the gifts in my life was hearing story read to me. And what's interesting, I have grandchildren that are the same way. You know, to be read to. It was lovely summer weather in the country, and the golden corn, the green oats, and the haystacks piled up in the meadows and looked beautiful. The stork walking about on his long red legs chattered in the Egyptian language, which he had learnt from his mother. The cornfields and meadows were surrounded by large forests, in the midst of which were deep pools. It was indeed delightful to walk about in the country. In a sunny spot stood a pleasant old farmhouse, close by a deep river, and from the house down to the waterside grew great burdock leaves so high that under the tallest of them a child could stand upright. The spot was as wild as the center of the thick wood. In this snug retreat sat a duck on her nest, watching for her young brood to hatch. She was beginning to get tired of her task, for the little ones were a long time coming out of their shells, and she seldom had any visitors. The other ducks liked much better to swim about in the river than to climb the slippery banks and sit under a burdock leaf to have gossip with her. At length, one shell cracked, and then another, and from each egg came a living creature that lifted its head and cried, Beep! Beep! Quack! Quack! said the mother. Then they all quacked as well as they could, and looked about them on every side at the large green leaves. Their mother allowed them to look as much as they liked, because green is good for the eyes. How large the world is, said the young ducks, when they found out how much more room they now had than while they were inside the eggshell. Do you imagine this is the whole world, asked the mother? Wait till you have seen the garden. It stretches far beyond that to the parson's field. But I have never ventured to such a distance. Are you all out, she continued rising. 
No, I declare, the largest egg lies there still. I wonder how long this is to last. I'm quite tired of it. And she seated herself again on the nest. Well, how are you getting on, asked an old duck who paid her a visit. One egg is not hatched yet, said the duck. It will not break. But just look at all the others. Are they not the prettiest little ducklings you ever saw? They are the image of their father, who is so unkind, he never comes to see. <laughs> Let me see the egg that will not break, said the duck. I have no doubt it is a turkey's egg. I was persuaded to hatch some once, and after all my care and trouble with the young ones, they were afraid of the water. I quacked and clucked, but all to no purpose. I could not get them to venture in. Let me look at the egg. Yes, that's a turkey's egg. Take my advice. Leave it where it is and teach the other children to swim. I think I will sit on it a little while longer, said the duck. As I have sat so long already, a few days will be nothing. Please yourself, said the old duck, and she went away. At last, the large egg broke, and a young one crept forth crying, Peep, peep. It was very large and ugly. The duck stared, on it, stared at it and exclaimed, it is very large and not at all like the others. I wonder if it really is a turkey. We shall soon find it out. However, when we go to the water, it must go in if I have to push it myself. On the next day, the weather was delightful and the sun shone brightly on the green burdock leaves. So the mother duck took her young brood down to the water and jumped in with a splash. Quack, quack, cried she, and one after another, the little ducklings jumped in. The water closed over their heads, but they came up again in an instant and swam about quite prettily with their legs paddling under them as easily as possible. And the ugly duckling was also in the water swimming with them. Oh, said the mother, that is not a turkey. How well he uses his legs and how upright he holds himself. He is my own child and he is not so very ugly after all, if you look at him properly. Quack, quack, come with me now. I will take you into grand society and introduce you to the farmyard. But you must keep close to me or you may be trodden upon. And above all, beware of the cat. When they reached the farmyard, there was a great disturbance. Two families were fighting for an eel's head, which after all was carried off by the cat. See children, that is the way of the world, said the mother duck, wetting her beak, for she would have liked the eel's head for herself. Ugh. Come now, use your legs and let me see how well you can behave. You must bow your heads prettily to you, that old duck yonder. She is the highest born of them all and has Spanish blood. Therefore, she is well off. Don't you see she has a red flag tied to her leg, which is something very grand and a great honor for a duck. It shows that everyone is anxious not to lose her, as she can be recognized both by man and beast. Come now, don't turn your toes. A well-bred duckling spreads his feet wide apart, just like his father and mother, in this way. Now bend your neck and say quack. The ducklings did as they were bid, but the other ducks stared and said, look, here comes another brood, as if there were not enough of us already. And what a queer looking object one of them is. We don't want him here. And then one flew out and bit him in the neck. Let him alone, said his mother. He's not doing any harm. Yes, but he is so big and ugly, said the spiteful duck, and therefore he must be turned out. The others are very pretty children, said the old duck with the rag on her leg, all but that one. I wish his mother could improve him a little. That is impossible, your grace, replied the mother. He is not pretty, but he has a very good disposition and swims as well or even better than the others. I think he will grow up pretty and perhaps be smaller. He has remained too long in the egg and therefore his figure is not properly formed. <laughs> then she stroked his neck and smoothed his feathers saying, it is a drake and therefore not of much consequence. <laughs> I think he will grow up strong and able to take care of himself. The other ducklings are graceful enough, said the old duck. Now make yourself at home and if you can find an eel's head, you can bring it to me. And so they made themselves comfortable. But the poor duckling who had crept out of his shell last of all and looked so ugly was bitten and pushed 
and made fun of, not only by the ducks, but by all the poultry. He is too big, they all said, and the turkey cock, who had been born into the world with spurs and fancied himself really an emperor, puffed himself out like a weasel in full sail and flew at the duckling and became quite red in the head with passion so that the poor little thing did not know where to go and was quite miserable because he was so ugly and laughed at by the whole farmyard. So it went on from day to day till it got worse and worse. The poor duckling was driven about by everyone. Even his brothers and sisters were unkind to him and would say, Ah, you ugly creature, I wish the cat would get you. And his mother said she wished he had never been born. The ducks pecked him, the chickens beat him, and the girl who fed the poultry kicked him with her feet. So at last he ran away, frightening the little birds in the hedge as he flew over the, pa the palings. They are afraid of me because I am ugly, he said. So he closed his eyes and flew still farther, until he came out on a large moor inhabited by wild ducks. Here he remained the whole night, feeling very tired and sorrowful. In the morning, when the wild ducks rose in the air, they stared at their new comrade. What sort of a duck are you? They all said, coming round him. He bowed to them and was as polite as could be, but he did not reply to their question. You are exceedingly ugly, said the wild ducks. Well, that will not matter if you do not want to marry one of our family. <laughs> Poor thing, he had no thoughts of marriage. All he wanted was permission to lie among the rushes and drink some of the water on the moor. After he had been on the moor two days, there came two wild geese, or rather goslings, for they had not been out of the egg long and were very saucy. Listen, friend, said one of them to the duckling, you are so ugly that we like you very well. Will you go with us and become a bird of passage? Not far from here is another moor, in which there are some pretty wild geese, all unmarried. It is a chance for you to get a wife. You may be lucky, ugly as you are. <laughs> pop, pop, sounded in the air, and the two wild geese fell dead among the rushes, and the water was tinged with blood. Pop, pop, echoed far and wide in the distance, and whole flocks of wild geese rose up from the rushes. The sound continued from every direction, for the sportsmen surrounded the moor, and some were even seated on branches of trees overlooking the rushes. The blue smoke from the guns rose like clouds over the dark trees, and as it floated away across the water, a number of sporting dogs bounded in among the rushes, which bent beneath them wherever they went. How they terrified the poor duckling. He turned away his head to hide it under his wing, and at the same time a large terrible dog passed quite near him. His jaws were open, his tongue hung from his mouth, and his eyes glared fearfully. He thrust his nose close to the duckling, showing his sharp teeth. And then splash, splash, he went into the water without touching him. Oh, sighed the duckling, how thankful I am for being so ugly. Even a dog will not bite me. And so he lay quite still while the shot rattled through the rushes and gun after gun was fired over him. It was late in the day before all became quiet. And even then, the poor young thing did not dare to move. He waited quietly for several hours. And then, after looking carefully around him, hastened away from the moor as fast as he could. He ran over field and meadow till a storm arose, and he could hardly struggle against it. Towards evening, he reached a poor little cottage that seemed ready to fall, and only remained standing because it could not decide on which side to fall. The storm continued so violent that the duckling could go no farther. He sat down by the cottage, and then he noticed that the door was not quite closed in consequences of one of the hinges having given way. There was therefore a narrow opening near the bottom, large enough for him to slip through, which he did very quietly, and got a shelter for the night. <clears throat> a woman, a tomcat, and a hen lived in this cottage. The tomcat, whom the mistress called my little son, was a great favorite. He could raise his back and purr, and could even throw out sparks from his fur if it were stroked the right way. The hen had very short legs, so she was called Chicky Short Legs. She laid good eggs, and her mistress loved her, 
as if she had been her own child. In the morning, the strange visitor was discovered and the tomcat began to purr and the hen to cluck. What is that noise about, said the old woman, looking round the room, but her sight was not very good. Therefore, when she saw the duckling, she thought it must be a fat duck that had strayed from home. Oh, what a prize, she exclaimed. I hope it is not a drake, for then I shall have some duck's eggs. I must wait and see. So the duckling was allowed to remain on trial for three weeks, but there were no eggs. Now the tomcat was the master of the house, and the hen was mistress, and they always said, we and the world. For they believed themselves to be half the world, and the better half too. The duckling thought that others might hold a different opinion on the subject, but the hen would not listen to such doubts. Can you lay eggs, she asked. No. Then have the goodness to hold your tongue. Can you raise your back or purr or throw out sparks, said the tomcat. No. Then you have no right to express an opinion when sensible people are speaking. So the duckling sat in a corner, feeling very low-spirited, till the sunshine and the fresh air came into the room through the open door. Then he began to feel such a great longing for a swim on the water that he could not help telling the hen. What an absurd idea, said the hen. You have nothing else to do, therefore you have foolish fancies. If you could purr or lay eggs, they would pass away. But it is so delightful to swim about on the water, said the duckling, and so refreshing to feel it close over your head while you dive down to the bottom. Delightful indeed, said the hen. Why, you must be crazy. Ask the cat. He is the cleverest animal I know. Ask him how he would like to swim about on the water, or to dive under it, for I will not speak of my own opinion. Ask our mistress, the old woman. There is no one in the world more clever than she is. Do you think she would like to swim, or let the water close over her head? You don't understand me, said the duckling. We don't understand you? Who can understand you, I wonder? Do you consider yourself more clever than the cat or the old woman? I will say nothing of myself. Don't imagine such nonsense, child, and thank your good fortune that you have been received here. Are you not in a warm room and in society from which you may learn something? But you are a chatterer, and your company is not very agreeable. Believe me, I speak only for your own good. I may tell you unpleasant truths, but that's a proof of my friendship. I advise you, therefore, to lay eggs and learn to purr as quickly as possible. I believe I must go out into the world again, said the duckling. Yes, do, said the hen. So the duckling left the cottage and soon found water on which it could swim and dive, but was avoided by all the other animals because of its ugly appearance. Autumn came and the leaves in the forest turned to orange and gold. Then as winter approached, the wind caught them and they fell and whirled in the cold air. The clouds, heavy with hail and snowflakes, hung low in the sky and the raven stood on the ferns crying, croak, croak. It made one shiver with cold to look at him. All this was very sad for the poor little duckling. One evening, just as the sun set amid radiant clouds, there came a large flock of beautiful birds out of the bushes. The duckling had never seen any like them before. They were swans, and they curved their graceful necks while their soft plumage shone with dazzling whiteness. They uttered a singular cry as they spread their glorious wings and flew away from those cold regions to summer countries across the sea. As they mounted higher and higher in the air, the ugly little duckling felt quite a strange sensation as he watched them. He whirled himself on the water like a wheel, stretched out his neck towards them, and uttered a cry so strange that it frightened himself. Could he ever forget those beautiful, happy birds? And when at last they were out of his sight, he dived under the water and rose again, almost beside himself with excitement. He knew not the names of these birds nor where they had flown, but he felt towards them as he had never felt for any other bird in the world. He was not envious of these beautiful creatures, but wished to be as lovely as they. Poor ugly creature, how gladly he would have lived even with the ducks had they only given him encouragement. The winter grew colder and colder. He was obliged to swim about on the water to keep it from freezing. But every night the space on which he swam became smaller and smaller. 
At length it froze so hard that the ice in the water cracked as he moved, and the duckling had to paddle with his legs as well as he could to keep the space from closing up. He became exhausted at last and lay still and helpless, frozen fast in the ice. Early in the morning, a peasant who was passing by saw what had happened. He broke the ice in pieces with his wooden shoe and carried the duckling home to his wife. The warmth revived the poor little creature, but when the children wanted to play with him, the duckling thought they would do him some harm, so he started up in terror, fluttered into the milk pan, and splashed the milk about the room. Then the woman clapped her hands, which frightened him still more. He flew first into the butter cask, then into the meal tub, and out again. What a condition he was in. The woman screamed and struck at him with the tongs. The children laughed and screamed and tumbled over each other in their efforts to catch him. But luckily he escaped. The door stood open. The poor creature could just manage to slip out among the bushes and lie down quite exhausted in the newly fallen snow. It would be very sad were I to relate all the misery and privations which the poor little duckling endured during the hard winter. But when it had passed, he found himself lying one morning in a moor amongst the rushes. He felt the warm sun shining, and he heard the lark singing, and saw that all around was beautiful spring. Then the young bird felt that his wings were strong as he flapped them against his sides and rose high into the air. They bore him onwards until he found himself in a large garden before he well knew how it had happened. The apple trees were in full blossom and the fragrant elders bent their long green branches down to the stream which wound round a smooth lawn. Everything looked beautiful in the freshness of early spring. From a thicket close by came three beautiful white swans rustling their feathers and swimming lightly over the smooth water. The duckling remembered the lovely birds and felt more strangely unhappy than ever. I will fly to those royal birds, he exclaimed, and they will kill me because I am so ugly and dare to approach them. But it does not matter. Better be killed by them than pecked by the ducks, beaten by the hens, pushed about by the maiden who feeds the poultry, or starved with hunger in the winter. Then he flew to the water and swam toward the beautiful swans. The moment they espied the stranger, they rushed to meet him with outstretched wings. Kill me, said the poor bird, and he bent his head down to the surface of the water and awaited death. But what did he see in the crystalline below? His own image. No longer a dark gray bird, ugly and disagreeable to look at, but a graceful and beautiful swan. To be born in a duck's nest in a farmyard is of no consequence to a bird if it is hatched from a swan's egg. He now felt glad at having suffered sorrow and trouble because it enabled him to enjoy so much better all the pleasure and happiness around him. For the great swans swam around the newcomer and stroked his neck with their beaks as a welcome. Into the garden presently came some little children and threw bread and cake into the water. See, said the youngest, there's a new one. And the rest were delighted and ran to their father and mother, dancing and clapping their hands and shouting joyously. There is another swan come. A new one has arrived. Then they threw more bread and cake into the water and said, The new one is the most beautiful of all. He is so young and pretty. And the old swans bowed their heads before him. Then he felt quite ashamed and hid his head under his wing, for he did not know what to do. He was so happy and yet not at all proud. He had been persecuted and despised for his ugliness, and now he heard them say he was the most beautiful of all the birds. Even the elder tree bent down its boughs into the water before him, and the sun shone warm and bright. Then he rustled his feathers, curved his slender neck, and cried joyfully from the depths of his heart, I never dreamed of such happiness as this while I was an ugly duckling. That's an amazing story, as all old stories often are. And I don't know how many of you have gone back and read, I don't know what you call them, fairy tales, children's stories. I grew up on them, so I know them all. But they have, they have amazing wisdom in them. 
What I find amazing in the story, and it's full of, he's a very good reader of feelings and nature and all the rest, but there's this thread through the story <clears throat> that's funny but sad. And that is, we tend to disregard those who are not like us. And if someone is not like us, we either want them to go away or they want them to, we want them to become like us. In the story, I got a kick out of several things. The first old duck that came and saw the big egg and said, that's a turkey. And then she was so angry. Why was she so angry with the turkeys that she hatched? Remember? They wouldn't swim. But turkeys don't swim. Anybody here have a cat? Have you ever watched a cat swim? Cats hate the water. I mean, a dog sees the water. It jumps in the water. Joy has a bird bath out in front of our house. And on some of these cold mornings, we have to go out there and fill it again because it freezes. But the birds will come over there and they'll pick in the water and take a drink. Then they start to luxuriate in the sun and they jump in it. Twirl around in the water, puff out. They just love. I'm thinking, why do you want to play in the water you drink? Ooh, they're not... One of the things that I think is very important in this that's true on an individual level is that when we talk about identity, it's very important to vindicate and affirm every human being's identity. One of my favorite stories, and I think Jamie is the one who told me this story, when Walt Disney was six years old, or he could have been seven, and he took an art class, you know, they, they had art in school. And they said, draw something. So our Dis Walt Disney drew pictures of flowers. But his flowers had faces. And the teacher came over to me and she says, Walter, flowers don't have faces. And this kid, this is amazing. He knew who he was. Mine do. Have you ever realized how sometimes we inhibit or discourage creativity because we want people to be a certain way. And all through this story, you find everybody attacking the duckling because he's different. They don't know what he is. And, you know, I think if you raise the family, you, you, you'll see your children have similar struggles. And one of, the, one of the most important things we can do as parents, as teachers, as mentors, is to affirm and substantiate who the person is, how they were made. And, you know, another favorite statement of mine, you remember Revi Litvin, the Hope of Israel, that came out here? Most of you seem to have forgotten. She's one of the, actually the first people that came to us and talked about what we now would call the Messianic thing. But she, she gave these tests on spiritual aptitude, and, and one of the things that she said, and, and because she's a Sabra, Hebrew's her first language, English was a struggle for her. And I've, I've, I've never forgotten this statement. This is just the way she said it. She said, remember, fishes swims and eagles flies. <laughs> you may not remember that, but I, she was a very bright person, but let me tell you, another language is a challenge. But isn't that so obvious that fish swim and eagles fly? And why would you ever put an eagle down because it's not swimming? And you see... The other thing is, in this story that comes out, um, this bird doesn't find itself till it discovers who it is. As long as it thinks it's a duck, it is never going to be happy. I think this is an interesting story in the, in the face of what's happening in our country today where so many people are confused. I mentioned to you the counseling. And the, uh, the transgender thing I find very, very troubling. Again, I realize people are in pain and they, they, they're having issues, but is there anything more clear than what gender you are? For 99.99% of the population, there are people that's a problem. Most people, you're a boy or a girl. Based on this story, 
the best thing that can happen to a boy is to find out he's a boy. And that the way he is is perfectly fine. You know, one of the things we do to hurt people is all boys will play with trucks and all girls will play with dolls. Well, guess what? You're going to find some little boys that want to play with dolls. I don't care. We sometimes get to be like the animals in this story. But there's something about finding out who you are. And then, and then the, one of the real sad things in this is when his mother says she wishes he'd never been born. I've run into people my age that can still remember hearing their parents say that. It, our identity is rooted in our parents. I mean, that's who we are. And this kind of separation is very painful. I thought about this, you know, at some length. And, and I've got another example here. I want to read you a short story. I think we know that we're Levites. Sometimes we may not know what that looks like. But I, would, I just want to leave several thoughts with you. But one very important thing is if God has determined you're a Levite, you're going to find frustration, futility, all kinds of angst, unsettledness, trying to find your identity somewhere else. If that's who you are, that's who you are. And there's another interesting story I want to read you about a, a young man in Hungary. Jobbik is the name of a party in Hungary called Movement for a Better Hungary. But what it really is is an ultra-nationalist political party. It's extremely white right-wing. I don't know how many of you pay attention to what's happening in Europe, but the amazing number of immigrants that have been brought in have really stirred what I would call the ultra-nationalist sem sentiment that says, I want Hungary to stay Hungary. I, I don't want Hungary to be some other country. And we talked to people at the Congress that were from Sweden, and it's not that they dislike Muslims. It's not that they dislike these people from the Middle East, but they've been brought into their country and they're disrupting and tearing their country apart. And they're supposed to just stand by and watch it. And so there are feelings being engendered by this. A little bit like some of our far right. Anyway, he was part of this Jobbik. And it was fascist, neo-Nazi, racist, and anti-Semitic. You'll almost always find these ultra-right identity. It's like our Aryan nations kind of stuff. It's accused Jews of being part of a cabal of Western economic interests attempting to control the world. You've heard the stuff. Protocols of the elders of Zion, the Rothschilds, all this built. Anyway, that's, that's how this party operated. It, uh, yeah, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion is something I was given to read by a member of the House of Aaron when I was in high school. Uh, it's a forgery. It's the most anti-Semitic thing on the face of the world, but it grew out of this fear of the Jews because they seemed to have so much economic power. And it was believed even when the Jews were being beaten, suffering pogroms, uh, they didn't have enough power to vote anything, and yet it, this was believed. So on one occasion, the Jobbik party asked for a list of all the Jews in the Hungarian government. Disturbingly, in the Hungarian par parliamentary elections in April 2014, this party, this anti-Semitic party, secured 20% of the votes, making it the third largest party. Until 2012, one of its leading members was a politician in his late 20s. And those of you who saw the funny thing about hockey, and, you know, uh, his name has 30 letters, all consonants, I am now, I cannot say this man's name. Sanad Shegedi, we'll call him. S-Z-E-G-E-D-I, you say it. Anyway, he's a man. He was a rising star in the movement, widely spoken of as its future leader. But one day in 2012, that day he discovered he was a Jew. 
Some of the members of the party had wanted to stop his progress and spent time investigating his background to see whether they could find anything that would do him damage. You know how we operate in politics. It's, it's like when Eagleton was McGovern's running mate. He hadn't been the vice, president, vice presidential candidate for two weeks and someone discovered that he had needed psychi psychiatric counseling 20 years before. He had to withdraw. This is the kind of... Anyway, so, so they're looking for something to slow him down. He's going too fast, getting ahead. What they found was that his maternal grandmother was a Jewish survivor of Auschwitz. So was his maternal grandfather. So in other words, his mother is 100% Jew. Half of Shigeti's family were killed during the Holocaust. Do you have any idea what this would be like? To be part of this party that you think the Jews are what's ruining Europe and ruining Hungary and somebody's trying to slow you down and they find out your family's a Jew. Shigeti's opponents started spreading rumors about his Jewish ancestry on the internet. Soon Shigeti himself discovered what was being said and decided to check whether the claims were true. They were. After Auschwitz, his grandparents, once Orthodox Jews, decided to hide their identity completely. When his mother was 14, her father told her the secret, but ordered her not to reveal it to anyone. Shigeti now knew the truth about himself. He decided to resign from the party and find out more about Judaism. He went to a local Chabad rabbi, Slomo Coves, who at first thought he was joking. Nonetheless, he arranged for Shigeti to attend classes on Judaism and to come to the synagogue. At first, Shigeti says, people were shocked. He was treated by some as a leper. But he persisted. Today, he attends synagogue, keeps Shabbat, has learned Hebrew, calls himself David. In 2013, he was circumcised. When he first admitted the truth about his Jewish ancestry, one of his friends in the Jobbik party said, the best thing would be if we shoot you so you can be buried as a pure Hungarian. Another urged him to make a public apology. It was this comment, he says, that made him leave the party. I thought, wait a minute. I'm supposed to apologize for the fact that my family was killed at Auschwitz? It kind of changed his... As the realization that he was a Jew began to change his life, it also transformed his understanding of the world. Today, he says, his focus as a politician is to defend human rights for everyone. I'm aware of my responsibility, and I know I will have to make it right in the future. Identity is really crucial. It's, it's really very important. And yet we do know what it says in... 2 Corinthians, I was going to say first. 2 Corinthians 5, where it says, if any man is in the Messiah, he's a new creation. That part is, is absolutely true. But I think it's significant that we have this writing that we talked about at the last feast. The bishop had this experience where he's caught up when he looks. The primary feeling he gets from the people on the globe is confusion. They don't know who they are. They don't know where they belong. They don't know why they're here. Why am I a human being? What, what's the point of my being here? And of course he's told to build a house for all the tribes. I don't totally know how all of this plays out. But I'm confident that our identity in the Lord is related to our identity in Israel. And that when it says that through the blood of the Messiah, we have been brought into the commonwealth of Israel, whether or not you are genetically or ethnically part of Israel, you join that nation. There's a scripture that uh, I think you're all very familiar with. It. It's in 2 Peter 1. Do you remember the, the sequence in 2 Peter where Peter says, Therefore, add to your faith virtue and to virtue diligence. And he goes through all these things and you're like, to brotherly love this, and I probably should read it. But you, you read this list and you're thinking, well, sure, yeah, if I do that, I'd be perfect. <laughs> and, and then Peter says, well, if, if, if this isn't happening with you, you've forgotten you've been cleansed from past sin. 
Then he says, be all the more diligent to make certain your calling and your election. If you don't sense that you're called, if you don't sense that you're appointed, it doesn't work. You know, this fellow Christian wrote a book, and Mahan really liked it, had a lot of us read it. Remember the book, The Search for Significance? Human beings need to be something. Unfortunately, a lot of times we, we use who we are to lord it over or put other people down. And I, that's what I like the story about Shigeti is that he found out that the very people that he was despising and thought were the problems in all the world, he was that person. And it changed his perspective. He realized how ridiculous it is, for one thing, to blame people for dying at Auschwitz. I mean, that's amazing. But another famous scripture, how many of you know where it's found and we know that God causes all things to work together for good? Romans what? 828. I didn't finish it. What is it say? What's the finish of that? To those who are called according to his purpose. Who is that that's called according to his purpose? Everyone that responds to his call, right? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. It's really the work of the Holy Spirit to show a person their value and their significance before God. And you know, but we as people assist in that. One of the things I've watched is what happens to children with teachers. I particularly watched this with Lois. I've seen Lois take somebody who couldn't carry a tune. Literally, could not carry a tune. And in four years, they're singing solos. And I've watched the change in their perception of themselves. I've, I, because if there's anything that's toxic, if there's anything that holds us back, it's believing lies about who we are. It's a believing what we can't, what we believe we say we can't do. You know, even today in India, they're having political battles over the caste system. And I don't know how familiar you are with this. I'm not either. But in Buddhism, there are castes. The highest caste is the Brahmins. That's the priests. The bottom is what we would call in English the untouchables, and I've forgotten what it is in Hindu. But they've passed laws to try to deal with the discrimination against the untouchables. An untouchable was not allowed to allow his shadow to touch somebody in a higher caste. The laws were not written for the untouchables. And, and there's They've passed laws now trying to address that, but the party that's in power right now has been backing up a little on it because they're losing some of the support of the upper castes. And so there's this revolution, this revolt going on. And this reminds me of a story as we bring this to a close. Chuck Colson went to a prison in India. He went around the world sharing his concept that prisons need to be places where you rehabilitate people and not destroy them and that we could use some of the biblical concepts particularly what we call white collar crime he said why are we putting people in jail for white collar crime if someone extorted stole money have them pay it back and he anyway he went in and, and gave the basic gospel story if you another book that I always recommend people read if you haven't read Chuck Colson's Born Again it's one of the greatest books ever written it's fantastic, the experience that he went through with the Lord. But he shared this simple gospel message. And after his message, and he'd for some reason keyed in on before God, we're all equal before him. We're all, there's no difference, male, female, you know. And after the message, they all crowded around. He couldn't figure out what's going on. And then he noticed... They were reaching out. They wanted to touch him. It was all well, fine. He went out and he found out all these untouchables had never been allowed to touch an important person. Anybody with any value, they weren't allowed to touch them. They weren't allowed to be near them. 
And so as these men would come near him to touch him, they would break, break down and weep. Because they had learned the gospel more to him making himself available to them than all the words he said. And as we close this thing on identity, we never want the message about identity to be to put people down, to lock people in prison. That's what you shared this morning, Kathleen. Why did the Spirit of the Lord come upon Yeshua? To set the captive free. To release, to give sight to the blind. You know, that, that's the picture of the gospel. When we tell people who they really are in the Lord, it sets them free. Let's all stand.